Good morning. They're, uh, pay attention to me, not to them. All right, they're getting set. Oh, they did that fast. Okay, very good. Um, so we're uh, in a series, as I mentioned on the front end, in the book of James. Um, and last week we did a flyover talking specifically about uh, how in the book of James we, we find that in everything that is happening there is an authentic faith that is being proven. Are you real or are you not? Uh, if you are real in your faith, then you understand the reality of trial and you understand the benefit of perseverance. And it's in trial, it's in perseverance, that God reveals himself and in his revelation of himself, it drives us to a place to where we want to be what he's designed us to be, what he's created us to be, his purpose for our existence. Today, we are going to be in one of the core passages of the book of James. It is James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, and verse 12. Now, as we begin, I want to share with you, in my hands, I have these clay bowls. Now, these clay bowls, on the bottom of one, it says, Caitlin. On the bottom of the other, it says, Taylor. So these were actually clay bowls that my kids at, I, I think they were trying to put an age on here, so it must have been pretty young, right? But these clay bowls, and they've got these cherries, they've been painted. My girls, both my girls, created these bowls, and they gave them to me when they were just young girls. And parents, many of you probably have something very similar. You probably have something like that. And in my home, this actually sits in a very special place. It actually still sits up on the shelves uh, in one of our offices right next to all of our precious moments. And why does it sit there in such a place of honor? Why? Because it was especially given to me by my daughters who at the time when they gave this to me thought their dad hung the moon today, not so much, right? But at the time, they did when they gave that to me. And this clay is shaped, and it's special because it's shaped by the hands of my children. It's shaped by two individuals who then placed it into a kiln, and it hardened, and then they painted it, and then they engraved it, and then they gave it to me, and it's a treasure today, not because of the value of its contents, not because the value of that which it was made from, but it's valuable to me today because I know that it was given to me, it was shaped for me, and it was presented to me with two individuals who have an immense love for me, their father. You know, in the same vein, our lives are shaped. Our lives are shaped, each of us, created in the image of God, our lives are shaped. But not all those things that shape us as people is actually pleasant. Not all the shaping that God chooses to do in our life is actually fun. In fact, most of the difficulty that we go through in life, most of the things that we actually struggle with, most of what we experience is hard, it's difficult, and it's dreadfully painful. And the truth is, things happen in life. I said it on the front end. We are not immune from trial. No single individual in this room is immune from trial and the tribulation, as James calls it. And we don't actually, when we're in it, frankly understand it. We can say all of the religious things that we want to say, uh, we can pray all the religious prayers we want to pray. We can put on the mask. We can put on the face. We can do everything to make the outside world think that we're something that we're actually not. And the reality is, is we don't comprehend the purpose. We don't comprehend the reason. We don't comprehend the value. When we're in it, we don't get it. True or not true? When we're in it, we don't always get it. But this morning... I want to call to your attention how even in the worst of life, 
the most dreadful trials, the most dreadful trials can be a blessing and a reward. James, in chapter one, gives us a very clear representation that trials will come, they come with meaning, they come with purpose, and that ultimately in trial and perseverance, there's blessing and there is reward. And in this text that I'm gonna share with you today, there's six principles that I want you to understand that God uses in our shaping that you have to apply. There's six principles that God uses in the experience of being shaped, trial, tribulation, and trouble. And these six principles that are outlined will ultimately put us in a position where we're created in the image that God has desired us for to, to be created in, where we ultimately achieve and reach that purpose that he has for our life. Now read with me in the book of James chapter one, verses two through four and verse 12, it will be on the screen. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kind, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be what? Mature and complete, not lacking anything. Now go to verse 12. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. So the first thing I wanna do today is I wanna call out these six shaping principles and then we're actually going to illustrate what this text means live, okay? Now, when you look at the very first principle, it's one that we've all heard before it's one that if you've been in, in church or in Bible study for any length of time, you've probably heard this term repeatedly. So he opens up and he says, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kind. Now, the most important piece in this particular equation is joy, the principle of joy. How am I in the midst of trial how am I in the midst of a divorce? How am I in the midst of failure? How am I in the midst of death? How am I in all that comes against me in my life? How is it that I should consider those trials that will come joy? Well, the first thing that he tells you to do is he says, consider it joy. It's important that we understand if I'm gonna consider it as joy and I'm gonna allow God to shape my life because I'm gonna be in a place of joy, the very first thing that I have to do is I have to count the trial. Do you understand what he says? I have to count the trial. It is actually an accounting term and what he means is keep record of the transaction. It's like journal, 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 refer, refer, refer. You guys hear me talk about journaling a lot. Journaling, not a journal entry into an accounting book for you accountants here today. I'm talking about emotions and feelings and writing them on a piece of paper, right? And so I encourage you each and every week to take time to journal why because it demonstrates to you and for you what God is or is not saying in your life. And so if we're going to count it all joy, we have to keep record of the transaction. That's what he's saying. Keep record of the transaction. How do we do that today? I encourage you to journal, to write it down to have a place where you can be open before God and you can actually say to him, God, how can I consider this pure joy? How can I consider what's going on in my life pure joy? In fact, when you read that text and you think about joy, it's seemingly to me a senseless response to the chaos of the circumstances that I'm in that are actually crushing me, God. So God, let's get real for a moment. You see what I've been through. You see what's happened in my life. You see the past nine months of my personal existence from the loss of my wife to everything that happens in my life. And God, you're telling me to fulfill wholly, completely, see this as joy. 
And the reality is, is my conversations where God went more like this. I don't see this as joy, God. Yeah, this is coming from your pastor. I don't see this as joy. I see it as senseless. I don't understand it. I don't, I don't comprehend it. God, why would you want to crush me? Why do you feel like, God, that you have to take me, put me in a position to where you've got to put me in a place to where I'm flat of my back? You crushed me, God. Why? What you discover is this. Joy is not a product of the circumstance. Listen to me. My joy is not a product of the circumstance. My joy comes as an act of my will, placing my confidence not in what David can do, not in what David can accomplish, not in what David wants out of this life. But I can look at this trial with joy, and I can count it, and I can journal it, and I can reflect on it as joy. Why? Because the hardship that God has now brought into my existence is allowing me to understand and know what faith actually is. It is putting me in a position to where I am revealed more than ever before a true confidence and a hope in God. Not in circumstance, not in people, not in what's around me. But what I can be joyful of is despite no matter what it is that come ag comes against me, my confidence is the fact that God will pick me up and carry me through. What I have learned is this, and what I've seen is this, is that God, in my lowest moments, brought an individual to me that I needed. God, in my lowest moments, had someone pray for me. God, in my lowest moments, had someone text me. God, in my lowest moments, had someone take me to dinner, take me to lunch. Whatever it was, God showed up in the lowest moments and the pain of the past nine months of my life, and he revealed himself in a way that I wouldn't I wouldn't have otherwise known. And because of that, there's joy. The second shaping principle is when. The principle of when. He says there, whenever, when. So here's the deal. You can be assured today of this. You will face trial. Trials will not be avoided. The unexpected will happen. And in this room today, you can consider the unexpected. Just this weekend, the Danzer family, great nephew, three years old, at a Bible study. Parents are at a Bible study seeking God. The three-year-old boy falls into the pool, drowns, and they had to pull him off life support yesterday. Russ is in Florida with the family today. Three years old, parents at a Bible study seeking God. Three-year-old child drowns, unexpected. Think about the Fitzgeralds in our congregation. Just a couple of weeks ago, they lose their 35-year-old son, Keith, gone in just a moment. I know for a fact that I have seen and talked to specific people that are in this room today where the spouse walked in the door and unexpectedly said, I want a divorce. Unexpected. And whenever it says, when you face trials, when you face trials, the idea that's presented here is that you're plunged, you're immersed, you're thrown into these circumstances. It is unexpected. You are unaware, and it comes at you. You may not be ready for it, you're not bracing for it, but suddenly this trial enters into your life, and you're plunged into this trial. He doesn't say if, he says when. Every single individual in this room understands or will understand that text. Trials can catch us by surprise and engulf our entire existence. Number three, the principle of purposeful trials. Trials, he uses the word plural. It's a plural. It's not a one and done. Believe me, having gone what I've gone through in the past nine months, I pray to God regularly, please let this be one and done. Is that honest or not? Is that real or not? God, I can't do this again. I can't lose somebody again. I can't deal with this again. You know, I'll give you a perfect example of what it, what it, what it does for me. You know, my daughter, Caitlin, um, she's you know, now getting close to 30 weeks pregnant. She had Hudson early, right? And she starts to have this past week these early contractions, and then they tell her she's even dilating a little bit. And I 
cool on the outside. I'm telling you, I am freaking out on the inside. And all I pray to God is 36 weeks, 36 weeks, 36 weeks, 36 weeks. God, I cannot take it. Can't take it. Trials. He says trials. They come. They're coming. We're all going to experience the test. We're all going to experience the difficult circumstances of life. And guess what it will do? It'll bring about revelation of our faith, and it'll bring about revelation of our dependency on God. Trials reveal a whole lot about you, your relationship with God, and it'll move you past religion in a hurry. It'll reveal if you're a religious person who's active in the religious activities of this existence, or it will reveal whether or not you've got a personal walk in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Because what I discovered in my trial is he's real, he walks with me, I had to lean on him, I had to depend on him, I had to call on him, I had to cry to him, but what I knew is in the end there was purpose in the trial. There was purpose in the tribulation, and he revealed in me an authentic faith that even I did not know existed within me. Number four, the, per, the principle of perseverance. This idea of perseverance is active endurance. It's the idea of remaining under, and it's a choice. Just like joy is an act of the will, I choose joy, I choose to remain under the trial. I choose to persevere. I choose to actively endure. You and I, in our trial, we have a choice. And the picture that's presented in actively enduring is that I am weighted and will I stand underneath the weight? Will I remain underneath the weight? Because you think about it. Whenever those trials come into your life and they're weighty and they're heavy and you don't comprehend them, let's, let's think for just a moment. First of all, the experience is not good. Agree? The feeling is not good. The circumstances that are about me, they are not good. And in fact, the pain of it, it's unbearable. The weight of it is crushing. But I choose to actively endure, I choose with intention to submit to what God is doing in this weight that he has placed on my life. It is a choice. It's a choice. It's a choice. We have three responsibilities when it comes to submission. Number one, active in recognition of the trial. Don't be ignorant of the trial. God, what is it that you're doing? I have to be active in my recognition of the trial. God, how are you speaking? How are you communicating in this part of my life? Number two, I have to be active in my intention to move through the trial. I've got to be intentional that I'm going to move through the trial. And I have to be active in my submission to God's plan for the trial. I have to know it's a trial. I have to be willing to submit to what it is that God is doing, and I have to be willing to comprehend that God has a bigger purpose and a bigger plan. The trial is not designed to crush you. Believer, listen to me. The trial is not designed to crush you. The trial is not designed to eliminate you. The trial is designed to strengthen you. Now, those of you that lift weights... One of the most productive exercises that you can do that's not good for you when you get my age, so you need to lighten the weight, right? But one of the most productive exercises that you can do is squats. Why? Did you know whenever you do a squat, it is going to work the entire, the weight drives downward and it works the entire existence of your body. So as that weight is upon you, it's working every bit of who you are. God himself, when that weight is placed on us, I have a choice. And that choice is I can stand, I can remain under that load, or I can say, I'm not doing this. I have a choice to walk away from it. In fact, I can linger and I can wallow. I can linger and I can wallow. In fact, in my loss, I can tell you there were days in which I chose to wallow. I didn't want to get out of bed. I didn't want to talk to people. I didn't want to exist. 
I didn't want to live another day. I didn't want to proceed at all with my life because I didn't comprehend what exactly God was doing or why he was doing it, but I remained under the weight by choice, by choice. Number five, the principle of maturity. As I remained under the weight, what I discovered is this. God was putting me in a position to be tested and approved for his work. Tested and approved for his work. This is a Jewish thought here. The idea is that whenever they would take a lamb and they would sacrifice that lamb, before they would sacrifice that lamb, they had to look at that lamb and they had to test and approve that lamb for sacrifice so that it was fit to offer to God. Listen to this. Fit to offer to God. What I began to discover and mature in my life, in my trial, is that I wanted to be fit to offer to God. That though I didn't comprehend it, though I didn't understand it, though I didn't like it, though I didn't enjoy the journey and the aspects of what was happening, I chose joy. I chose to be actively enduring. And in the choosing, what I discovered is that God began to prepare me to be fit for a work that he is doing. I mean, look around at this church, and I don't say this in any arrogant way. Look around at this church. You guys know where this church was two years ago, do you not? Are we all right? Westcott people, you know exactly where this church was two years ago. Look around you today, right? And this has been a part of the journey. Because each and every week, God pours into me, I have the opportunity to pour into you, and we're watching people catch a vision, we're watching people understand what it means to be a part of the body of Christ, to do life on life. And guys, that came out of my own pain, loss, and grief, because I knew God was up to something, and it was more than just what David wanted out of life. Do I like that? Maturity is a product of submitting to the work despite the pain of the labor. And a lot of us don't like the pain of the labor. We don't like it. And then last, the principle, blessing, and reward. Blessing means this, happy. He's saying to be happy in trial. If you consider it all joy, if you recognize perseverance, If you recognize that God is moving you to a place of completion, he's moving you to a place of of, of maturity, then guess what? There's happiness. Blessing. It means happiness. It's the same word that Jesus used in Sermon on the Mount. It is the idea of happy in trial. Happy in trial. How can I be happy in trial? I can be happy in trial. Because I understand that in the work that God is doing, whether it's my financial struggle, whether it's my struggle with addiction, whether it's my struggle relationally, whether it's whatever it may be that comes into my life that is a trial, that is a weight, that is a burden, the reason that I can be happy is because I know that God is strengthening me in this process. Listen, when you go to the gym, When you first start, and let's say you're at 225 and you're trying to get to 200, when you're at 225, it's not fun to get up in the morning, is it? But when you wake up that next week and that scale's 220, a little more motivating, is it not? You wake up the next week and it's 215. You wake up the next week and it's 200. And you wake up the next week and you're at 195 and you see abs that you haven't seen since you are 18 years old. What happens to you? You get what? This is maturing this is working this is happening it's being manifested right before me and the same things happening in our trials is that we're being built we're being shaped we're being developed and over time you begin to see it but you don't see that unless you're willing to move through the process and in that process you can be happy in the trial but for most of us We miss what God seeks to produce because we resign in the trial. You're stuck. You're stuck right where you were at five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago because you have resigned in the trial and you've chose personal pity over God's production in your own life. I don't mean that harshly. It may have sounded that way. Don't mean it harshly. But it's true, is it not? 
Why me, God? So now, what I want to do is I today want to illustrate this for us, physically. I want to illustrate this. So today with me is, many of you know, but Daniel Brooker and his wife, his, uh, Brittany, and his family are here with us today. Daniel has a ministry called Refuge Widowers, of which most of you that are part of West Cobb Church, you know in my journey that Refuge Widowers was a key component to my healing. Just seven weeks after Angela's passing, I chose, was, and, and Daniel accepted me into the retreat for Refuge Widowers. Now there were a couple of things with that that were concerning. One, I was seven weeks out of my loss. Seven weeks. Two, I was near the age limit of 55. They didn't want old guys, right? But this ministry had an impact and an influence on my life. And there was a significant demonstration that we did on the final night of the retreat. We took a rod of steel and we placed that rod of steel in an open fire. And we heated that rod of steel. And then each one of us, all men who had lost their wives, many of them 35, 40 years of age, we went through a process to where we cut the steel, heated the steel, shaped the steel, allowed our lives to be placed on the anvil, and allowed God to do his work in our existence. I'm gonna move this back so that everyone can see. Now I'm gonna kinda share with you my journey in this process. What I learned, what I took away, and I'm gonna share with you today what it is that you can take away. First, we have a rod. And this rod actually represents me. Now what you'll notice though is that this particular rod is doubled up. This is me nine months ago waking up on September 17th married to the love of my life. joined together. This represents all the things, you see these colors, are all the things that Angela and I were going to do in life together. So there's 9-21-85, the very first date. There's one month later when I told a 14-year-old girl she's going to marry me. She told me I was stupid, right? <laughs> but she married me. This was my plan to finish college, which I did. This was my plan right here for us to buy a home together. This was my plan for a boy and a girl. Well, I got girl, girl, so God's talking already, girl, girl. This was our plan to build a business together, to enjoy everything that life had to offer. This was my plan to grow old together. This was my plan to be Gigi and Papa until the very last day that both of us walked away on this earth. And it was supposed to be for us like the notebook. If you know that movie, not that I have a crush on Rachel McAdams, but like the notebook, right? And guess what? Suddenly, for me, it changed. It changed. And how did it change? How it changed for me was now Just me. 
just me. Nobody to come alongside of me, nobody to walk with me. And suddenly I find myself on the anvil. I'm in the fire. I find myself being tested. I find myself in a position that I didn't expect to be in. I find myself in a position that I considered not to actually be a choice. But yet, God puts me on the anvil. God continues to apply the heat. God continues to apply the pressure. And I've got a choice, and that choice is will I submit? Will I allow God to shape me? Will I allow God to use that hammer and pound me into the shape that he desires for me to be in? Guess what? If God's gonna do his work, that heat, it's not optional. If God's gonna do his work, that anvil, it's not optional. If God's gonna do his work, those pliers, they're not optional. Why? Because in all of this, God is gonna shape me God is going to twist me. God is going to change me into the person that he desires for me to be. This life that I live, I'm created in the image of God. And this is the design that God had for me. God knew that on September 17th that my life was going to change. And now it was going to be a journey that I was on. Now it was going to be a work that God was doing just in my life. I didn't like it. And in fact, I remember when we were going through that process, I kept saying, God, why? God, how? God, what did I do? God, I don't understand exactly what you're doing. And it wasn't God, I submit. God, I yield. God, do your work. I didn't like being on the anvil. I didn't like the twisting. I didn't like the turning. But something happened in a moment. Whenever this process was going on with me that night at Refuge Widowers, there was something that changed in me. And the something that changed in me is I can allow God to do his work in my life. And ultimately, I can allow myself to be an instrument of righteous, that, a righteousness that he is choosing to use. So I ask you a question. If you look at this process, that they're going through right now, this crushing, is that how you feel? This process, is that what you feel? It's not fun, it's not easy, it's not enjoyable, it's probably the truth is, it's not actually what you want to experience. But there comes a moment where God's done his work. And God chooses now to harden you and put you in a position to where you are usable. Where God puts you in a position to where that purpose is evident. And now God is not pounding you on the anvil. Now God is not twisting you on that anvil. Now God is not turning you upside down on that anvil. God is now filing, refining, and shaping and when this process is done guess what he puts you and he puts me in a position to where we are ready and we are usable for the work that he has for our life ready and usable for the work that he has for our life now I want to ask you this do you want to do life your way or do you want to do life God's way do you want to experience how God desires to shape you? Do you want to experience how God desires to build you? Do you want to experience what is necessary for God to create you into that being that is most useful, most impactful for him? Because what we have to understand is this, our existence is beyond the fact that we die. Our existence is beyond the fact that we live here on this earth. 
The reality is, is that God has a purpose, a reason, and a mechanism for all of us here in this room, and it's to fulfill the image that he has created us in. But we don't get there because we choose to resign in the trial. What I want to encourage you to do is step up in the midst of that trial and choose to attack it. Be intentional about how you're going to face that trial. Let God be God. Let God do the work that he desires to do. And you will then experience and know joy beyond anything that you can comprehend and or understand, church. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25. I want to read it to you. The book of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25. As we close, in Hebrews 12, 25, the writer speaks and he says, see to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised once more, I will shake not only the earth, but I will shake also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. What remains is our faith. What remains in the midst of the shaking in our lives? Listen, God speaks. You know how God speaks? How God gets our attention, and we don't like it, but God's gonna disturb our life. God's gonna create disruption and disturbances in our life He's a sovereign God. These things, they're allowed to happen. They're allowed to pass through. And some of these are small interruptions. Some of them are major interruptions. But the first thing that we have to understand is in your trial, God is speaking. Hear, heed what he's saying, and stop and pause and listen. We're in such a busy existence. Our world is filled with so much noise that we don't stop, pause, and listen. You've been through what you've been through for a reason. And it wasn't to put you in a position to be defeated. It was to put you in a position to be stronger so that you can be impactful in the world of which you're a part. And so people can be in right relationship with God who's redeemed us all. But if you resign in the midst of the trial and you don't hear what God is saying, your life perhaps could have made a difference in that one that needed to hear your story. But because you choose to walk off the field, because you choose to step aside, that individual that needs to hear your story, that needs to understand your trial, that needs to understand your pain, that individual and you're supposed to pour into their life, but you choose to back up and choose instead of stepping forward, then guess what? That person, it could change eternity and what it is that God has for them because you choose to back up and not to step up. Number two, God does shake. That verse 26 and 27 talks about the shaking. The voice of God spoke in such a manner that there's a shaking, there's a disturbance. God disturbed my natural order, but God didn't quit speaking to me. Hear that. God changed my natural order. All of these plans, all this that I shared with you, God began to rip it apart. He took the one thing that to me probably mattered more than anything else in this world, and he took it away. He changed the natural order of my existence, and he didn't do that because he hates me. He didn't do that because he doesn't love me. He did that because he has a greater work and purpose for me. What I've learned is the depth of the pain is directly translated to the depth of the work that God wants to do in your life. And I walk away today and I go, God, you got something big that you wanna do in my life and I choose that 
Whatever it is, I choose that. Whatever it is, I choose the anvil. Whatever it is, God, keep on pounding. Whatever it is, God, keep on twisting. Well, that's hard to say, but I choose that. Because God wants to shape my life. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, listen to this. In all this, you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come, listen to this, these have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your soul. Four things that I learned in God's shaping. One, I learned the reality of God to you and to me. The reality of God. When he disturbed my existence, my plan, and if you know me, I have plans. And he chose to disturb it and he said, you don't have plans. You don't have plans. And it was a moment to where the reality of God was before me, maybe as never before. Number two, the relationship of God with you. Whenever you face trials, you see God. God sees you. God's not foreign to the pain that you're dealing with. God, it's not foreign to him that the process is difficult. It's not foreign to him. But God is allowing and he is in and he is moving through the trial of which you're dealing with and what's going on in your personal existence as James talks about because of that relationship with you. He wants to be in a personal, intimate relationship with you, with you. And then third, the reason God has for you, there's most of us that are sitting in this room, we don't think that God has a reason for us. Yes, he does. The Bible tells us in the book of Genesis that we were created in his what? Image, say it. We were created in his what? Image. God has a plan and a purpose and a reason for your life. And what we deal with in this existence is not there to put us in a place of defeat. It is there to spur us on so that we step up to a place of victory. And victory is knowing that in and through my trial, God is active and at work in my life because he wants to use me as an instrument, an instrument of what? righteousness. He wants to use me as an instrument of righteousness. When I was on that anvil that night in November and I was pounding with the hammer and I was twisting and I was turning, when it was all said and done and I began to file, all I could think about was God use me as a weapon of righteousness. God, use me to battle the enemy. God, use me to step forward, not to step back. I tell people, I could have taken that particular circumstance Can you hear me? and I could have become a drunk. Nope, back here. I could have become Soundboard. a drug addict. I could have become Are you whatever doing you want to name. Or just and you know one? what? Everybody would have said, poor David, I get it. Instead, I chose work. I chose labor. I chose active endurance. And the result rather is what? To God be the glory. The result is not poor David. The result is what? To God be the glory. Because what I love about First Peter and that passage of scripture is what he's really saying is that when you go through this trial, this tribulation, this work that God is doing in your life, when you go through it, you're willing to step up as a person and go watch my life. 
That's what I chose. God, you do all that you want to do here. I'm submitting to it. And as I step out of this, God, I'm willing to go watch my life and see what God is doing. See how God is at work and see the difference that he is making. But so many of us put it in the context of our own selfish desires, our own selfish needs, and we forget that he's at work putting us in a position to be an instrument of righteousness designed for his glory and for his honor. So if you're here today and you are weary of the trial, I pray and I hope that you will leave encouraged. It's not something that is for naught. It is for specific purpose, specific reason to develop and shape you into an instrument of righteousness, ready to do battle for the kingdom of God. Let us pray together. Father, thank you for today, for this morning. God, I thank you, Lord, for the work that you're doing here at Westcott Church and in the lives of the people. God, I thank you, Father, for those that were here today and maybe they needed encouragement, they needed a word that would push them forward in their relationship with you. And Father, I pray that today they will leave feeling as if they can step up, they don't have to step back, they, they don't have to retreat. They can actually see themselves as an instrument that you choose to use so that others can know and understand and so that others can see the redemption of a good Savior, the goodness of a great God, one who loves us and who desires nothing more than for us to be fulfilled as the person that he's designed and created us to be. God, the process of getting there, we know it's not easy. We know it's hard. But God, we choose to allow you to do your work in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. We're gonna sing. We're gonna sing.